Hi, welcome back to Kiersey's Virtual Classroom. Today we are talking about stratigraphy. All right, so we're going to start off with a little bit of terminology or vocabulary. We're going to use a lot of different words in this lecture um, that you may have never heard of before, and that is okay. Um, some of what we saw last week we are seeing again, so keep in mind this builds on geochronology, just focusing more on the sediments and the sequences of those sediments. Okay, so the first thing here is stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is a branch of geology that looks at the order of events or relative position of what we call strata. And strata is a layer of rock or sediment that is characterized by a specific lithology. And a lithology is looking at the characteristics of the rock. Okay, so when we talk about strata, we're talking about a very specific type of rock that might correlate to another strata. And so here we're gonna look at some correlations and how rock units can be correlated across a landscape. Okay, so getting into lithology, I already kind of covered that. It's the description of the physical characteristics of the rocks that you are looking at that are visible in an outcrop. And remember, an outcrop is just a outcropping of rock that you can actually see at the surface. Lithostratigraphy is the classification of bodies of rock based on the observable lithologies. So if we can look at one type of rock and another type of rock and correlate them, we call that lithostratigraphy. So we're correlating rock units based on their positions and their lithology. Biostratigraphy is correlating patterns and beds using fossils. So it's similar to correlating lithologies or correlating the rocks, but we're correlating based on the fossils that are present within the rocks that we see. So starting with lithostratigraphy, again, this is a study of the rock layers where you can correlate units across stratigraphic columns. So stratigraphic columns can be obtained in a few different ways. The first way that we can get a stratigraphic column is by going out and observing a canyon, for example. For the Grand Canyon, we have a lot of layers that we can really easily see throughout the Grand Canyon. And so you can jot down all of that information, take measurable sections of each layer, each lithology, and create these stratigraphic columns, which basically shows a stacking up of all the different layers. Another way this can happen is by taking core samples. So this would involve a drill rig in which we send down a sampler into the earth and it collects sections of rock and in those sections, we would then start building the stratigraphic column, depending on the depth at which we see these sediments. And then from there, we can get our stratigraphic column. And so if you're interested in an area where you make a bunch of cores, you can then look at all of the cores you've collected and correlate across and see what is happening to the sediment. Is the sediment disappearing as you go west? Or is the sediment increasing as you go west? And you can kind of see the extent of the deposition of the different layers. Then with biostratigraphy, we use a little bit of that lithostratigraphy, but then we also correlate using fossils. So we will look for fossils that we know are similar and correlate units based on the fossils that exist. So if one layer has a trilobite in it and a layer over here, also has a trilobite in it, we can correlate those units most likely. Trilobites lived for a very specific time between the Cambrian and the Permian period, so they're a really good what we call index fossil so that we can correlate across the units. All right, now you might hear the term facies. This is another terminology. So facies are the overall characteristics of a rock that reflect its origin and differentiate the unit from another. And so there's, there's a lot of groupings. So we've got lithology, we've got facies. We also have formations. Formations are a body of rock having a consistent set of lithology that distinguishes it from a different body of rock. And so you might see some of these terms where we call it, um, you know, the Franciscan formation, or um, the next one would be the Great Valley group. The Great Valley group is a grouping of sediments that we see in the Great Valley and then up uh, against the east side of the coast ranges in California. 
So groups are, again, lithostrat lithostratigraphic units consisting of a series of related formations that have been classified to group them together to form this group. And so, like I said, sometimes they are groups of formations. So a group is technically bigger than a formation, typically. Um, and a formation is the next step. Then we have facies and then lithology. So this is just how we group together rocks and how we can correlate units across and then start actually putting names to the different rocks that we're seeing. Because while a lot of us might all see just, oh, it's just rocks. <laughs> all the rocks are different. And depending on the sediment available, the rocks are going to be, or the sediment's going to create different rocks. So it's important to be able to group them in these ways. All right, and then sedimentary basins are areas where sediment is deposited. So with sedimentary rocks, we talked about sedimentary deposits or depositional environments. So we're kind of going back to that a little bit and we are really just looking at basins here. And so basins can be driven by water or tectonics. Okay, and so here are some examples of those. We have passive margin basins, intercontinental basins, rift basins, and foreland basins. Okay, with this, each basin needs to have an accommodation space. If it doesn't have enough accommodation space, it can't accommodate the sediment. So we want to have a good available volume within a basin to allow for more sediment to be deposited. Otherwise, that sediment will probably move on or it will completely change the landscape entirely. So with accommodation space, this is um, basically a delicate balance. So we have this equation that we can use to look at that balance where T plus E equals S plus W. So T is the rate of tectonic subsidence or sinking in the basin. So this is the downward movement of tectonics. The E is the rate of um, global sea level change relative to um, the reference ellipsoid, <laughs> ellipsoid, excuse me. Um, so we want to make sure that we are getting a consistent rate of sea level change and we don't see this big overhaul of while well, sea level rose for a very significant amount of geologic history or sea level dropped for a significant amount of geologic history because that changes the accommodation space drastically. And then S is going to be the rate of sedimentation or the accumulation in the basin. So one of the things that um, is happening along, for example, coastlines in California is that when we start to cut off our rivers and streams and change them to, for example, the LA River is now a basically big canal because they have concreted the entire thing. And so the sediment load coming out of that river down to the coastline is almost none. Um, because there's no sediment transport. Everything is just along this concrete channel. If there's no sediment transport, those beaches are going to starve eventually. And so the rate of sedimentation accumulation is going to be impactful, especially along a coastline, if things change. And then W is the rate of change in the water depth within the basin. So this also goes into your continental shelf which aids in what the depth is going to be at a certain area where you can actually deposit sediment. So if most of your continental shelf is on land, so sea level is low, your accommodation space is going to be a little bit less as a marine deposition. But non-marine, there will still be a lot of depositional area, so the accommodation space will be higher. All right, then we have a rift basins. So as tectonics starts to shift things apart, so we have like a divergent play boundary here, we can get things called horse and grobbins, if you remember that from the faults and earthquakes lectures. That is when we have normal faults that dip away and toward each other. And when that happens, we see these up and down developments of basins and ranges, or also called horse and grobbins. And so those grobbins become basins where sediment can accumulate from nearby mountains, right? So weathering, weathers the mountain ranges, that sediment goes down and deposits in the basin. All right, we also have passive margins where our modern ocean basins will ultimately be sedimentary basins. 
Um, this is a result of ancient rifting. Major tectonic activity is generally absent at these locations. So this is where we're looking at coastlines. We don't see tectonics taking over here. It's really dependent on sea level change. So sea level rise and fall. Another tectonic related basin would be in a subduction zone. We have a lot in subduction zones where material can accumulate. So in a subduction zone, we have the oceanic plate diving beneath the continental plate, right? This is causing a lot of um, fractional melting and flux melting below the surface in the mantle. And then in addition to that, it's creating those volcanic island arcs, or maybe it's, if it's a continental plate, we're looking at continental volcanoes. And on either side of that volcanic development, we're going to have a fore arc, which is going to be on the side where the plates meet. And the back arc is going to be on the other side or the opposite side of where the plates meet. Okay, so those are two areas or two basins, back arc basin and fore arc basin where material can develop. For example, the Great Valley, where we have a lot of sediment today, where Fresno, Lemoore, um, you know, Sacramento, all of those cities lie in a previous four arc basin for the subduction zone that used to be off the coast of California. And then lastly, we have the trench, which is where the two plates meet, and you have a little bit of drag, and you have a little bit of accommodation space there for more deposition underwater. All right, so I kind of already went all over this, but here's the look at the four arc basin. You can see that it is between the trench and the volcanic arc that is developed. Um, and this can be a large area or small area. It depends um, a lot on the steepness of the subduction as well. So the steeper the subduction, the narrower the area will likely be because the volcanic arc will be closer to the subduction. So. We have a four arc basin here, which is a big basin where we can accumulate sediment and sediment can be deposited. And then on the opposite side of the volcanic arc, we have the back arc basin, which is going to be another area where we can accommodate sediment. Um, this is oftentimes a little bit larger of an area, depending on what else is happening further from this subduction zone. And um, again, this is a sedimentary deposit basin. It can be underwater initially, or it could be on land. Depends on the circumstances. All right, and then we have trench sediments, which can accommodate or acclimate, accumulate, excuse me, between the oceanic crust and the continental crust that are colliding. Um, obviously, some stuff, which is that accretionary wedge material, is being scraped off that oceanic crust, that top of that plate that's subducting. Um, but then there's still a little bit of trench area there where sediments can be deposited under water. All right, and then getting into sequence, strateg sequence stratigraphy, excuse me, um, we need to look at transgression and regression. So this has to do with what is sea level doing? So with normal sea level rise, we see the marching back of material. And so what happens is, for example, this A material or sediment A is marching back as sea level starts to rise. And so is B and so is C. Okay. And then we can kind of look at that stratigraphic column over time and see what has happened um, to this sediment or to this area as far as geologic history is concerned. All right, so in a transgression, which is sea level rise, um, we see a lot of erosion happening along the coastlines. We have a fining upward. So if we took a section like they have here of material into a stratigraphic column, it shows you a facey sequence of more coarse material at the bottom and the finer material at the top because everything is marching in. So as you see, it come closer to the terrestrial land, 
all that material is being pulled further inland. And so we see coarse material at the bottom, fine material upwards. And so you can look at a stratigraphic column and decide if you think it was a transgressive or a regressive sequence. So here, just by looking at the stratigraphic column, we know that in this narrow window of time, we had sea level rise, which is important for geologists to be able to reconstruct the geologic history of an area. And then on the opposite end, if we have regression, all of the material will start marching from away from the land, right? So as sea level falls, the material will start to march towards the sea. And so we call this a depositional area because as the water leaves, it leaves stuff behind, right? It's not eroding coastlines anymore. And so we see the opposite here. We see coarsening upward. And so the finest material in a stratigraphic column will be at the bottom and the coarser material at the top as it starts to march backwards. And so again, when we look at the sequence, we can say, oh, okay, we know that in this time period specifically, there was sea level fall. So that's how one of the ways that we get a lot of data on what sea level was doing throughout geologic history. Uh, we're not just making guesses entirely. We look at things like sequence, sequence stratigraphy, that's really hard to say, uh, to be able to tell what sea level was doing at the time. And sometimes it goes back and forth, right? So we might look at a stratigraphic column and it might have towards the bottom of that column in a time frame of transgressive, so sea level rise. And then on the top, it might have regression, which is sea level fall. And so you can see the flux in what sea level is doing over time just by looking at sediments and what they're doing. All right, so stratigraphy includes lithostratigraphy and biostratigraphy. There's a lot of other sub-stratigraphy studies um, that your book will go over, but I don't expect you to know all of those because this is, of course, an intro course. And so we can look at stratigraphic correlation to help geologists piece together past geologic conditions. And of course, sequence stratigraphy is very important in that picture as well. I will see you guys next time. Bye.